Hello, uh, my name is Kay Stefanik. I am the Assistant Director of the Iowa Nutrient Research Center. I'm excited to have the opportunity to create a webinar for Iowa Master Gardeners. For this talk, I'm going to be discussing ways to increase the abundance of wetland vegetation throughout Iowa. Before I get into my talk, I want to give a little bit of background about myself. I have a PhD from The Ohio State University in Environmental Science. My research is on wetland vegetation succession and also the role of wetland uh, vegetation in gaseous carbon budgets of freshwater marshes. My talk is going to have two main focus areas. The first is on wetlands in Iowa and the second part is going to be on how homeowners can incorporate wetland vegetation on their property. For wetlands in Iowa, I'm going to go over what exactly is a wetland, why do wetlands matter, what are some of the different types of wetlands you see in Iowa, as well as the state of wetlands in Iowa. For the second part, some of the ways to incorporate wetland vegetation I'm going to go over are going to include rain gardens and stormwater wetlands, decorative water features, planting in wet spots, planting around ponds or potentially even in ponds, and then I'm going to go over what are some of the native Iowa wetland plants that you could potentially add to your landscape and what are some of the plants you're going to want to avoid, some of the invasive and non-native plants that you don't want to plant, but you also want to keep an eye out for to remove if you see them coming into your wetland area. And finally, I'll wrap up with some of the different resources you can use to find different plant species as well as resources for implementing some of these different wetland practices. So, I'm going to be talking about wetlands. What exactly is a wetland? A wetland is land that is saturated with water long enough to promote wetland or aquatic processes indicated by poorly drained soils, hydrophytic vegetation, and various kinds of biological activity where, which are adapted to a wet environment. Now, there are a number of different wetland definitions, but they all tend to include three main things. They include something on water, poorly drained soils, and hydrophytic vegetation. So basically, a wetland is made up of water, poorly drained soils, and hydrophytic vegetation. With the water or the hydrology of a wetland, you may have standing water, or you may just have saturated soils. It's also possible that the standing water or saturated soils are only going to be present during a portion of the growing season. So you may go out to a wetland at a dry part of the year, maybe in beginning of fall, and see that your wetland doesn't have any standing water. That doesn't mean it's not a wetland. It just means that the basin isn't holding water during that specific time. What makes up a wetland is not just having water year round, but also having those hydric soils and the hydrophytic vegetation. There are a number of different ways that wetlands can receive water through precipitation, through surface inflow or groundwater inflow. And then there's a number of different ways that wetlands can lose water through evapotranspiration, through surface outflow, as well as through groundwater outflow. Next, wetlands have hydric soils. Hydric soils are soils that have formed under conditions of saturation or flooding. They tend to have anaerobic conditions or low oxygen, low uh, lacking oxygen within parts of the soil. On the right hand side of the slide, you can see I have a zoom in close up of what upland soil matrix, so soil particles and pore spaces look like, and then a zoom in of wetland soil matrix. With the upland, you're going to have a mix of soil particles and pore spaces that are filled with both water and gases. Whereas with the wetland, you can see that the pore spaces between the soil are completely filled with water. Any gases in those pore spaces is going to be dissolved within that water. And because of this, it promotes the development of anaerobic conditions. Because of all this water, you can have anaerobic conditions within your sediment and soil in the wetland. Because of these anaerobic conditions, you tend to see some unique features in wetland soils. These can include glaying 
or gray streaks, blue-gray streaks within wetland soil. And you can also have the formation of oxidized rhizospheres. Oxidized rhizospheres are rust-colored red areas around roots that develop when oxygen leaks out of those roots and interacts with the iron in the soil. Now, if you look at the lower right-hand side of the slide, you can see a map of Iowa with a lot of blue areas. All of those blue areas are areas of hydric soil within Iowa. And this doesn't mean that there's currently a wetland on site. This just means that in each of those blue areas, at some point in the past, maybe century or two, there's been either a wetland or aquatic habitat in those areas. So you can see there's been a lot of wetland and aquatic habitat throughout the state of Iowa in the past. Then moving on to vegetation, wetlands have what are called hydrophytes. Hydrophytes are flood tolerant plant species. And you can categorize plants based on the probability that the plant will be found in a wetland. Uh, this is referred to as its wetland indicator status. So obligate plants are gonna be found 99% of the time in wetlands. Facultative wet plants are gonna be found between 67 and 99% of the time in wetlands and facultative plants are going to be found between 34 and 66 percent of the time in wetlands. Facultative upland and upland plant species, typically you will not see them within a wetland ecosystem. And these indicator uh, statuses are based on how tolerant those plants are to being in saturated or standing water conditions. In the picture on the right, I have some cattails. You can see they're in standing water, cattails are obligate wetland plants. So your obligate wetland plants are going to be able to withstand periods of um, shallow water or continuously saturated soils. There are different types of vegetation that you can see in a wetland. You might see algae. Algae is mostly microscopic. It's gonna be either single cells, small colonies, or filamentous, uh, you may see phytoplankton. These are free floating suspended algae suspended in the water column. Or you might see paraphyton. This is algae that's attached to submerged surfaces, either rocks or even the stems of plants. And then you have macrophytes. Macrophytes are higher order vascular aquatic plants. And that's what I'm gonna be focusing on for my talk today. There are four primary growth forms of macrophytes. First growth form are emergent macrophytes. Emergent macrophytes are rooted in the substrate in the soil. They grow through the water column and then they emerge above the surface of the water column. So there's usually a good amount of the plant that's standing above the water surface. The next growth form is floating leaved. Floating leaved plants are rooted in the substrate of the soil. They grow through the water column and then the leaves will float on the surface. In some cases, like what you see in picture two, those leaves can grow a little above the surface, but typically they're found floating on the surface. The next growth form is submerged. Submerged plants are once again rooted in the substrate, but instead of growing out of the water column, they grow within the water column. So these plants are almost always completely submerged. The only times you may see part of these submerged plants at the surface is when they're flowering. Some of the flowers will actually come up to the water surface. And then the fourth primary growth form of macrophytes are free floating. Free floating plants are unrooted and float on the water surface. Now, just because they're unrooted, this doesn't mean that they don't have roots. These free floating plants will likely have roots. They may just look a little different than roots of other plants. Roots of free floating plants tend to be a little more filamentous looking, and instead of attaching to any substrate, they just dangle within the water column, and they take up all of the nutrients, the other things they need directly from the water. I've gone over what wetlands are. Now I'm gonna talk about why wetlands are important. Obviously, there's the intrinsic value of wetlands. They're important because they exist. But wetlands also provide a number of ecosystem services. 
Now, ecosystem services are essential direct and indirect benefits that nature provides to humans. Some of the wetland ecosystems that we see are flood prevention, improved water quality through nutrient and sediment removal, wildlife habitat, recreational opportunities, as well as food and fiber. Wetlands help with flood prevention by holding water on the landscape. Wetland basins can store excess stormwater. So if you have a precipitation event, water can flow into that wetland basin and it will stay in that wetland basin um, as long as you don't have excessive amounts of water. Uh, this holding of water by the wetland basin can help prevent immediate downstream water transport. So instead of water flowing over the surface of land, getting directly into streams and rivers where it quickly flows downstream, you're gonna be holding the water on the landscape. Whenever you hold water on the landscape, this can help reduce downstream flooding as well as flood severity. And whenever you're reducing flooding and flood severity, you're also reducing economic loss associated with that. For the water that's stored in the wetland basin, it will eventually slowly leave the wetland could leave through evapotranspiration, where it's evaporated from the surface of the wetland or being transpired through plants. You can have water percolating into the ground, and being incorporated into the groundwater, or you can have water leaving the wetland through surface flow. But the key point is that water is going to leave the wetland basin slowly. Another ecosystem service of wetlands is nutrient and sediment removal. You typically see removal of excess nutrients and sediments through things like settling out, settling out of your sediment, as well as the phosphorus bound to those soil or sediment particles. You can have nitrate utilization by microorganisms. Microorganisms take up the nitrate utilize it, transform it into other things, and you get the release of nitrogen gas back to the atmosphere. And then you can also have nitrogen and phosphorus uptake by plants. Now we care about nutrients because when you have too many nutrients, you can get what's called eutrophication. Eutrophication occurs when high levels of nutrients stimulate excessive algal growth, like you can see in the picture on the left. This excessive algal growth will eventually die sink to the bottom of that body of water where microorganisms will break that algae down. In the process of breaking down the algae, the microorganisms are gonna take up oxygen from the surrounding water. They can take up so much oxygen that they make that water uninhabitable for fish and invertebrates and other animals because the water is so low in oxygen or has hypoxic conditions. Nutrients and eutrophication can be caused by a number of different things. In Iowa, one cause is associated with agricultural runoff. So when you have agricultural farm fields, you have fertilizers that are being put onto those farm fields, maybe manure being put onto those farm fields. And from that, you can have the loss of nitrogen and phosphorus, loss to nearby waterways. One way to help reduce this loss loss, especially to reduce nitrogen, is to install a wetland, to place a wetland between the source of the nutrients and the waterway to help hold those nutrients in that area, to prevent them from flowing downstream. If you prevent those nutrients from flowing downstream, you can help reduce eutrophication downstream. Another ecosystem service of wetlands are that they provide wildlife habitat. They provide food, shelter, as well as nesting and burrowing habitat. And these animals that are utilizing wetlands can either be more permanent residents or they can be things like migratory waterfowl, things that are flying through Iowa and stopping and using these wetlands on their way through the state. In the picture on the right, you can see there's a pile of dead cattail leaves, some mud, maybe some algae mixed in there. That's a muskrat hut. So muskrats will collect cattail leaves, they'll collect mud, they'll collect algae to create their, their hut, the area where they overwinter in a wetland. Some of the different types of animals you'll see in a wetland include amphibians, reptiles, fish, birds, mammals, and a number of different invertebrates. 
Some common wildlife that you'll find in wetlands of Iowa include things like the common green darner. So you'll see different dragonflies, darners, damselflies. There are a number of birds, things like mallards, red-winged blackbirds, different types of geese, heron, swans, utilizing wetland habitat. You can also find amphibians like leopard frogs, smallmouth salamanders, tiger salamanders, and then various reptiles, painted turtles, snapping turtles, and a number of different types of snakes that can utilize this habitat. Two more additional ecosystem services that wetlands provide include recreational activities or recreational opportunities, as well as food and fiber. Wetlands can be locations of um, hiking trails. They can be locations to kayak in, also places to hunt, to bird watch, to just get out and enjoy nature. You could potentially also have ecotourism set up around a wetland. Ecotourism is basically a tourism industry that's built around a natural area to bring people in to get out into that natural area. And then finally, wetlands provide food and fiber. Throughout the world, wetlands are used as um, a source of food. So for things like rice, rice is a wetland plant that you find in many, um, many of the continents throughout the world. They can also provide food through animals, um, such as waterfowl. So duck hunting could potentially provide food. And then the plant material themselves can act as building material. There are um, native populations that have used things like cattail, different types of reeds for weaving to make things like bowls, baskets, or um, cushions. In Iowa, we see a couple of main types of wetlands. These wetlands are differentiated on the basis of vegetation, as well as where water is coming from in these wetlands. So on the upper left-hand side, we have marsh habitat. Marshes are dominated by herbaceous vegetation. They typically have water coming in from a combination of sources, so precipitation, surface inflow, as well as groundwater inflow. And they can have water leaving the marsh through different avenues, through evapotranspiration, surface outflow, and groundwater outflow. The next type of wetland in Iowa is the swamp, which you can see in the upper right-hand corner. Swamps are dominated by woody vegetation. You may have some herbaceous under vegetation in the understory, but predominantly the vegetation is going to be woody. In the lower left-hand corner, we have a fen. Fens are pretty unique habitat. You can find fens in the eastern part of Iowa as well as around Lake Okoboji. Fens receive most of their water from groundwater inputs. Uh, because of this, they typically don't have large areas of standing water. Uh, instead, they tend to have saturated soils with maybe a few areas of standing water, very small areas of standing water. They tend to have typically moderate levels of nutrients uh, and somewhere around either a neutral or possibly even basic pH. Because of the conditions of a fen, a lot of the vegetation in a fen is typically lower growing, so you'll see smaller plant species in fens. They also are peat accumulating systems, so that means that as the plants die, they don't get broken down readily. So that organic matter will accumulate over time as a peat layer. And then finally, the last type of wetland I'm going to talk about are prairie potholes. Prairie potholes are mainly found in the Des Moines lobe. They were formed through uh, glaciers moving over the landscape. Prairie potholes are depressional wetlands, so they're found in depressions in the landscape. They may have shallow water, or they may just have saturated soils. You may also see prairie potholes drying out throughout the year. And even though they're dry, that doesn't mean it's not a wetland. It just means that the wetland isn't holding water at that particular point in time. You also have to look to see if there's hydric soils and hydrophytic vegetation. If it has those characteristics, then it's still a wetland. Now, prairie potholes, um, at least in this part of Iowa, 
may have higher levels of nutrients because they may be surrounded by uh, agricultural row crop land or other um, agricultural land. Because they're uh, depressional in the landscape, their depressional nature allows them to act as kind of a sink. Um, so you have the accumulation of nutrients, solutes, even sediment from the surrounding land as it flows into this depression in the landscape. With all of these different types of wetlands, you can divide them into different plant zones. So in this diagram, there's the upland and prairie zone. This is actually the terrestrial zone. This is the dry zone that's not really part of the wetland. On the right hand side of the figure, you have wet meadow, emergent, and floating and submerged zones. These are more of the wetland habitat where you're gonna find wetland plant species. Wet meadows, are going to be more of your saturated soils or slightly wetter conditions. Um, this is where you're going to find your facultative and facultative wet plant species. Your emergent zone is going to have standing water for at least a portion of the year. This is where you're going to see your obligate plants. Things like cattails will live in the emergent zone. Typically, your emergent zone is gonna be between a few centimeters of standing water to about point, uh, sorry, about 0.5 meters of standing water. Um, anything above about 0.5 meters, you get into your floating and submerged zone. Floating plants are going to be able to survive in about 0.5 meters to about one meter water depth. Anything deeper than that is too deep for them to survive. Instead, you'll see more of your floating and submerged, sorry, you'll see more of your submerged vegetation in these deeper water areas. In the state of Iowa, originally pre-European settlement, we had about 4 million acres of wetlands. Today, there's only about 420,000 acres of wetlands remaining. So if you calculate that out, it's an 89% loss of wetland habitat, a loss of about 3.5 million acres of wetland habitat, as well as um, loss of wetland plant abundance. When you lose the wetland habitat, you lose plant abundance. In the Des Moines lobe or the glaciated region of Iowa that has a number of prairie pothole wetlands, the wetland loss has been even higher. It's estimated there was a 99% loss of wetlands in the Des Moines lobe since European settlement due in part to development as well as agriculture. Now, as I said, with this wetland loss, we lose wetland species abundance. Um, and while we may not have all of these large wetland habitats still within Iowa, there are ways that we can add back in wetland vegetation. So as a homeowner, there are a number of different ways you can incorporate wetland vegetation on your property into your landscaping. Some of these options include the use of rain gardens or stormwater wetlands. You can include the use of a decorative water feature as pictured on the right. You can plant in wet spots in your yard you can add plantings to the edge of your pond or in your pond, or if you're really adventurous, you can create a wetland in your backyard. Starting with rain gardens, you can see rain gardens don't actually have the word wetlands in their name. And the reason for this is that they tend to be drier and they don't really function as a wetland ecosystem. So on the right hand side, you can see a picture of a rain garden along a street. These rain gardens are designed to capture and hold uh, rain or stormwater runoff for a short period of time after a rain event. These rain gardens tend to be relatively shallow and because they don't hold standing water, you can't really plant obligate plant species in these areas. Instead, you're probably gonna be looking at facultative plant species to put in these areas. In addition to building rain gardens along roads, you can also add a rain garden to collect water from any impervious surface on your property. In the picture on the left, they're actually collecting water from their roof and directing the gutter into a rain garden. 
This specific rain garden is about four to six inches in depth. It's not really designed to hold water for extended periods of time. It's only going to hold water after a storm event. And that water is going to be lost through evapotranspiration or it's going to um, slowly infiltrate into the ground. Because of this, you want to be careful about your plant choices. You want to stick more towards those facultative plants to make sure that they're, they're capable of surviving um, in those sometimes wet conditions. And there are a number of really pretty flowering plants that can be used to add uh, a very nice landscape look to your yard. If you're interested in putting in a rain garden, the Iowa Rain Garden Design and Installation Manual is a good place to start. This manual was designed in partnership between the Iowa Stormwater Education Program, the Iowa Stormwater Partnership, USDA Natural Resources Conservation Service, and the Iowa Department of Agriculture and Land Stewardship. Another option is a stormwater wetland. Stormwater wetlands are very similar to rain gardens. They both have the same basic purpose. They're catching water after a storm event. This can either be capturing water through precipitation directly or through surface flow. In the case of stormwater wetlands, they're actually designed to function as a wetland. So it's not uncommon to see standing water in stormwater wetlands long after a rain event has occurred. Stormwater wetlands tend to be a little larger in scale as well as deeper than your typical rain garden. So you're gonna to have to have a decent area to install a stormwater wetland if that's what you're interested in. Uh, if you don't have the space though, take a look at what your community is doing in terms of stormwater regulation. If your community is looking into different ways to handle stormwater, you can be an advocate for the addition of stormwater wetlands to help treat and store some of that stormwater. So even if you don't have the property, you can still advocate for the use of stormwater wetlands within your community. Another option is to add a decorative water feature. In this picture, you can see there is a shallow pond surrounded by rocks. Most of these decorative water features are going to have a plastic layer that holds the water within the pond. So your water isn't actually flowing between the pond and the surrounding uh, drier landscape. This particular setup has a waterfall, so it's going to have a pump system and likely also has a filter system. When decorative water features are created, the plants that you see in the water are typically kept in pots, in flower pots. Since you have that plastic cover on the bottom that holds the water in, you're not typically going to see soil or sediment substrate in these ponds. Instead, flower pots are used. Now, if you like moving your plants around, redecorating your water feature every so often, a decorative water feature can be a good way to, to set that up because those flower pots are easily movable. And you can redesign the at least the plants in your wetland frequently. Um, one thing to keep in mind though, is because of that plastic layer, you don't have interaction of that water with the surrounding soil. So the plants that you add around your pond are likely gonna be more terrestrial species, those upland and facultative upland species. And they're not really gonna be wetland habitat. However, there is potential to add things like pollinator habitat around your decorative water feature. Another option and probably the lowest commitment option possible is to add wetland plants to a wet spot in your yard. On the left hand side of the screen, you can see a picture of a yard that is constantly wet. The homeowner in this case dug out that area slightly so that it was holding a small pool of water and they created what's called a pocket wetland. This pocket wetland has um, some lily pads, some pickerel weed, as well as some Joe pie weed planted in there. You can see it's a very small area of, of their yard, but they've managed to turn it into a wetland habitat that has some floating leaf vegetation, that has emergent vegetation, the pickerel weed, and then also has some wet meadow vegetation, the Joe pie weed. If you have a pond or if you're looking to install a pond on your yard, you can do some edge of pond plantings. 
In this illustration here, this pond was designed to, to have vegetation in it. You can see along the outer edge, there's a shelf. This shelf is designed to be less than 0.5 meters deep so that there's um, enough water for emergent plants to grow, but not enough water to drown those plants out. In this case, it looks like there are some cattails, some pickerel weed, as well as irises growing in the emergent zone. In this illustration, there's also a deeper zone, probably between 0.5 meters and one meter depth, that allows for the growth of floating plants, uh, lilies in this case. They have their lilies in pots, so if they wanted to pick those up and move them around, they could. If you have a pond that's already in existence, I would suggest taking a look at the bathymetry of your pond. So the bathymetry is basically the topography of your pond. You want to figure out where are your shallow spots um, that you could potentially plant your emergent vegetation, so areas that are less than 0.5 meters deep, and then where are your areas where you could potentially plant floating vegetation, areas that are between 0.5 and 1 meter deep. If you don't have any areas like this, if your pond basin has particularly steep edges, you could potentially plant some wet meadow plants directly around the perimeter of the pond. Or if you really want to add some wetland vegetation but don't want to do any um, earth movement to create shallower spots, you can also use a floating wetland. On the left hand side is a picture of a floating wetland mat. This floating wetland mat is made of rubber and it has a number of pre-drilled holes in it. There's also an anchor on the bottom that allows you to put and keep this floating wetland in the part of the pond that you want it to be in. The way these floating mats are designed is that each of those holes on the top is a space for a plant plug. So you would put a plant plug into the mat, the roots would grow down into the water column, and instead of rooting into the substrate or the soil, those roots are just going to be free floating in the water column and they're going to pick up all of the nutrients they need directly from the water column. Typically, you'd put facultative wet, maybe some obligate plants in there, uh, depending on the specific species, but you want to make sure that if you're using a floating wetland, you're using kind of smaller species, preferably at least less than one meter, maybe even smaller. Once you start to get into taller species, you can have weight issues on the, the floating wetland. And then for those of you who are adventurous, you can install a backyard wetland. You can go out and create your own wetland habitat. If you're interested in doing this, I would suggest starting off by looking at the USDA Natural Resource Conservation Services uh, backyard wetland tip sheet. It's going to give you an idea of where on your property you may be able to install a wetland, where that wetland might work best. It also gives you some design information on how you should have your um, wetland edges sloping, how deep it should be, and provides information on what types of plants you could potentially put in. Uh, I'd also recommend talking to uh, local conservation specialists to get a better idea of how to set up your backyard wetland. I've gone over all of the different ways you can add wetland habitat. Now we're getting into the plant part. So if once you have your idea or your design of what you want to put in, you have to figure out what plants you want to add in there. I would start by looking at the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers National Wetland Plant List. This plant list can be found at the uh, link at the bottom of the uh, slide. You can separate out your list based on the state you're in. So in this case, I pulled up the list for Iowa. And for this list, it gives you a wetland rating summary. So it gives you a count of the plant species that fall into those five different uh, probability categories that the plant will occur in a wetland. For Iowa, you can see that there are 356 plant species in Iowa that are obligate, 
and 278 plant species that are facultative wet. Now, I do want to point out that this list includes both native and non-native species that are found in Iowa. So you want to try to avoid non-native species. I'd recommend first pulling up this list to get an idea of what species are here, and then use, using something like the USDA plant database to make sure that the plant you want to add to your wetland is going to be a native plant. But I pulled up this list as well as the numbers just to give you an idea of how many different plant options you have if you want to install some wetland vegetation to your property. You can see there are a lot of different options, more than 500 different species you could potentially add to your property. Now, once you get to the planting phase, you've designed your rain garden, your stormwater wetland, your maybe pocket wetland, you then need to think about what vegetation you want, but also what vegetation will work in the different areas of your wetland. So when you think about your wet meadow, your emergent and your floating and submerged zones, remember that your wet meadow is going to have plants that are facultative or facultative wet. Your emergent are going to be obligate plants and your floating and submerged are also going to be obligate plants. Also keep in mind that emergent plants don't grow well if the depth is more than 0.5 meters and your floating plants are going to be in a water depth of 0.5 to 1 meter. Also keep in mind um, how long throughout the year or throughout the growing season your wetland is going to be holding water. Uh, you want to make sure that there's enough water to support obligate plants if you put those in. I think this is a good time to take a quick pause. Um, a lot of wetland vegetation, especially obligate wetland vegetation, looks kind of unique compared to terrestrial plants. A lot of wetland vegetation either looks or has uh, basal leaves. And they can either have actual basal leaves coming from the base of the plant or because of the fact that they're coming out of the water column, it may just look like they are made up of basal leaves. When you're trying to do a plant identification of emergent vegetation, I think one good place to start is to look at the cross section of the stem or the leaf. Now, it won't give you an exact species, but it'll give you an idea of what group of plants you're potentially looking at when you're identifying plants. Now, for, for this, I want you to take a couple minutes to try to guess what plant group is associated with each of these stem and leaf cross sections. So think back to things like cattails, sedges, rushes, different maybe sayings you've heard in the past. Um, also give you a hint, there's also an iris and grass in there as well. And try to figure out which um, stem or leaf cross-section matches up with different plant groups. Okay, so now that you've taken a couple minutes to try to figure out which, what each of these stem or leaf cross-sections are, we're quickly gonna go through each of them. So for the first one, you can see that one side of the leaf has a flat edge and the other has kind of a, a softened V shape to it. This is a cross section of a cattail leaf. Number two reminds me somewhat of um, when little kids draw a bird, how it's kind of a V shape. Uh, this V shape cross section of the leaf is from burr reed or spraganium. Number three, you can see that there's a clear triangle shape. There are edges to this particular stem cross section. Remember, sedges have edges. So this is the cross section of a sedge stem. And I also wanna point out that this is a stem, not a leaf. And then four, if you remember rushes are around, you've probably got your bull rushes and your spike rushes. I wanna also point out four and seven. Four, you can see has plant tissue all throughout that stem. Whereas seven, the interior of that stem is hollow. 
So if you have a stem cross section that's round, that's full of tissue, it's going to be a rush. Whereas if that stem is hollow, it's likely going to be something else. Then five is your iris leaf. Irises have kind of a fatter center and then very narrowed tapered edges to the leaf. Number six has kind of a similar profile to iris and leaves, but they're much fatter and the taper at the edges of the leaves happen much quicker. So they're not nearly as thin as the iris leaf. And number six is the cross section of a sweet flag plant. And then finally seven, you can see it's a circular cross section that's hollow. These are grasses. So once again, your hollow stems are going to be grasses. Now I'm gonna go over some of the more, I think, unique looking vegetation that you may add to your landscape. Um, if you remember, I mentioned that there's probably five, 600 different wetland plant species. So I'm only gonna go over a couple of them um, in the different emergent floating and wet meadow categories. But I wanted to let you know that there are many out there. I'm just gonna highlight some of the different groups and some of the plants that I think look a little more unique. So we're gonna start off with emergent vegetation. On the left-hand side, you can see there's burr reed, uh, Spargania muricarpum. It has these kind of longer, narrow leaves, also has um, kind of these burr-shaped flowers, uh, these globular flowers on a stalk. Next, in the middle is bulrush. Uh, these are actually a type of sedge. They're lower growing, um, and then on the right hand side is soft stem bull rush. What you see is actually the stem. The spikes are the stem coming up with the flowers on the top. Any leaves associated with things like bull rush are typically very diminished. You may just see a basal sheath around the leaf. Going back to our leaf cross sections, the burr reed has that kind of uh, uh, bird shape drawing to it, bulrush, sedges have edges, and then the soft stem bulrush, this is an actual type of rush, is round. So sedges have edges, rushes are round. Two additional types of emergent uh, plant groups you might add include pickerel weed on the left hand side. Uh, this plant has some very nice purple uh, flower spikes. And then on the right are arrow leaf. And there are a number of different types of arrow leaf uh, found in Iowa. They typically have a pretty white flower associated with them. And then getting into floating plants, so things you plant in deeper water areas, you have things like white water lily on the left, yellow pond lily in the middle, and then on the right hand side, American lotus. White water lily and yellow pond lily are typically smaller and do better in smaller settings, smaller wetland or pond settings, whereas American lotus is a larger plant and it's going to need more room. So if you have a larger wetland or a larger pond, American lotus might do better. And in your wet meadow, you could add something like marsh marigold on the left hand side. Marsh marigold is a low growing plant that has yellow flowers. In the middle, you can see some sweet flag. The leaves of sweet flag um, look like they're basil. Uh, they also tend to be kind of a little more tropical looking. They don't have uh, highly conspicuous flowers though. So if you look, uh, it's a little below halfway down the picture of the sweet flag. You can see kind of in the middle of the screen, there is um, a yellow spike. That yellow spike is the sweet flag flower. Now, even though they don't have a highly conspicuous flower, I think they're a pretty nice looking plant. They're also a very nice smelling plant. So if you are to break up the leaf of sweet flag a bit, uh, you'll get a very um, kind of nice, uh, maybe not floral, but a nice sweet plant smell. And then on the right hand side are milkweeds. In this case, swamp milkweed. But there are a number of different types of milkweed that do really well 
in that wet meadow area, including things like common milkweed. And if you're looking to put in pollinator habitat or maybe monarch habitat, I'd highly encourage the use of, of milkweeds in, in your wet meadow plantings. If you're looking for a showier plant or a more ornamental looking plant for your wet meadow, cardinal flower on the left hand side is good. It's a very bright red flower. Uh, plant is about one and a half to about two feet tall. If you're looking for something more unique that's maybe not particularly um, flower-like, you could use something like scouring rush. Uh, scouring rush, I've also heard it called horsetail rush as well as snake grass. You can see that the scouring rush is just a stalk that comes out of the ground and it has a very small flowering type head on the top, but it's not actually a a flower per se. So if you're looking for something more unique, I think that's a pretty good plant. And then on the right hand side is Joe Pie Weed. These are also some nice flowering plants that you can add for additional pollinator habitat in your wet meadow. I've gone over some of the cooler plants from Iowa that you can add to your wetland. Uh, the plants that I've talked about so far are things that you will likely be able to find from a grower. Um, when you're ordering plants, whether it's seeds or plugs, I would highly recommend trying to go through um, growers who are in Iowa or maybe in the Midwest to make sure you're not pulling plants with um, genetics from other parts of the state, or sorry, other parts of the country. Um, now, while I've talked about things you should plant, there are things you should avoid. Things that are either invasive or non-native that you don't want to plant or that you want to keep an eye out for and remove them if you see them coming into your wetland area. One thing you want to avoid buying is water lettuce. Water lettuce is a free floating plant, so its roots dangle in the water column. It looks like a very tiny head of lettuce and it's something that once it gets into your open water area or kind of your deeper water area in your wetland, it can take over rapidly. You also want to avoid flowering rush. This is somewhere between an emergent and a wet meadow plant. Flowering rush isn't a true rush. It has a rush-like stalk, but then it has actual um, flowers at the top, these kind of purple, purple-white flowers. This is another plant that it's something that at one point you could purchase from, from growers, but I would not recommend buying it if you see it. It's one of those plants that can easily take over your planting if you put it in. Now something that you don't wanna buy but also wanna keep an eye out for is purple loosestrife. Purple loosestrife is going to be a meter to two meters tall and have these very bright showy purple um, flower stalks on top. If this comes in, you want to make sure that you remove it as soon as possible. And something else to watch for that could potentially come in is reed canary grass. There are a number of stands of reed canary grass throughout the state. Another uh, type of plant that if you look at the picture on the right hand side, you can see will form a monoculture. It will outcompete the other species in the area. And then finally, um, if you have different maybe woody species you want to add to your wetland, uh, make sure you don't add salt cedar. Salt cedar is uh, invasive in Iowa. If you do want to add something that's more of a shrub or a woody species to your wetland planting, I'd recommend going with something like buttonbush. And one last plant is common reed or phragmites. Phragmites is something you have to worry about coming in on its own, uh, especially if you're I believe in the southeastern part of the state. Uh, Phragmites will grow more than two meters tall. It forms very dense stands that will outcompete other things. And this is something that you want to remove right away because if you don't, if you allow it to set up a good root structure, it's going to be something you're fighting to remove for years to come. Now, I think this is a, a good time for another quick question. So I have here a picture of 
planting zones in a wetland. So thinking back to some of the wetland plant species I just mentioned, or maybe some wetland plant species that you know of, how would you go about planting the different zones in this particular wetland? And why would you put those specific plants in these different zones? Now, when you're doing a wetland planting, it's important to make sure that you know where your wet meadow zone, your emergent zone, and your floating and submerged zone are located. So based on the pictures that I showed earlier, in your wet meadow zone, you could add things like um, sweet flag, cardinal flower, scouring rush, joe pie weed, different types of milkweeds. In your emergent zone, in zone two in this case, these are going to be your obligate plants that are capable of withstanding some standing water, uh, usually less than 0.5 meters of standing water. And some of these plants could include burr reed, river bulrush, soft stem bulrush, pickerel weed, or arrow leaf. And then in your floating zone, in zone three, if you have water that's between 0.5 and one meter deep, you can add things like white water lily, yellow pond lily, yellow pond lily, or American uh, lotus. It's just really important to make sure that you're putting the appropriate plants in the appropriate zones in your wetland habitat. Your wet meadow are going to be your facultative and facultative wet, whereas your emergent and floating are going to be your obligate plants. Plants, as you all probably know, can be expensive. So you don't wanna end up spending a lot of money on plants and then putting those plants in areas where they won't be able to survive. So the biggest key component of getting your wetland planting right is just making sure that the plants you put in can tolerate the water level in that area. Now, finally, I wanna go over a couple of resources that you can use for adding either different structures or adding vegetation, wetland vegetation to your landscaping. If you're interested in putting in a rain garden, you can find resources at the Iowa Stormwater Education Partnership website, as well as in the Iowa Rain Garden Design and Installation Manual. If you wanna put in a backyard wetland, either maybe a pocket wetland or an actual backyard wetland, I would suggest starting with the USDA NRCS Backyard Wetland Tip Sheet, which provides information on where you could locate your wetland in your yard, how you should design your slopes, and potentially even what type of plants would work well in that backyard wetland. You may also want to reach out to a conservation specialists in your area to get a better idea of what plants you might use in that wetland or how you might design your wetland for your particular area. Once you've decided on the type of practice you want to use, you'll then need to decide what type of plants you want to use. I mentioned earlier the U.S. Army Corps wetland plant list. I think that's a good place to start, but then you also want to couple that with something like the USDA plant database. This USDA plant database will give you an idea of whether or not the plant you're looking at or the plant you're interested in is a native, a non-native, or an invasive. And I would highly recommend trying to keep your wetland vegetation in the native category and avoid planting anything that's non-native or invasive. I think it's also a good place to look to see if maybe you have a plant that comes in on its own, if you identify it, figure out what it is, you can then go to the plant database to see if it's a native or a non-native to get an idea of whether or not you need to manage that plant or remove that plant. Associated with the USDA plant database is also the wetland indicator status search. It's another wetland search tool through the USDA plant database that can give you some additional information on various wetland plants. Now, I just wanna wrap everything up with a, a few key takeaways. First, there are multiple ways to incorporate wetland vegetation into your landscaping. These range from low to high commitment, with low commitment just being planting some plants in wet spots, to high commitment actually constructing maybe a rainwater garden or a backyard wetland. 
Regardless of what you decide to add to your, to your landscaping, you're going to be providing multiple benefits. You're gonna see, first of all, an increase in wetland vegetation species abundance in the state of Iowa. The more, more wetland vegetation, the better. You can also be adding or increasing pollinator habitat, as well as potentially wetland habitat. And if you're going with something like a rain garden or a stormwater garden, you're also helping with stormwater retention in your area. And finally, I just wanna conclude with wetland plants, especially obligate wetland plants, are pretty unique. So you can use these to design a very unique, aesthetically pleasing landscape that's going to be different from what you're seeing in other neighborhoods or in uh, maybe your neighbor's yards. So you can put in something that's very unique in your area. Now with that, I wanna say thank you for taking the time to listen to the webinar. Uh, if you have any questions, please feel free to reach out to me. I can be reached at, uh, by email at kcstefan at iastate.edu, and I'd be happy to answer any questions you might have. Thank you.